Yes, you can hear me, great. Um, well, I'll start, I think it's one o'clock. Hi everyone, it's really lovely to see you all popping up there. Um, my name's Catherine Oliver um, and I founded Oliver Projects um, about a year ago now. And we are basically a roving um, gallery and consultancy, which means that we don't have a permanent exhibition space, um, but we do shows in various spaces. Um, historically, they've been in, in South East London, but that I'm sure will develop. Um, so the shows might be in people's houses, in empty shops, in, in small gallery spaces that I rent. Um, this current show with Tamsin Relly, Joseph Goody and Rebecca Harper is in my living room, um, which has been an incredible kind of lockdown project for us all. Um, so today we're talking to Tamsin Relly, um, who is an artist that I've known now for about five years. Um, we met because I used to manage the summer exhibition at the RA and Tamsin um, showed her work in the summer exhibition and um, she was selected to be in the first art sales um, show at the RA which was an exhibition called Painter Printmakers which happened about four years ago and since then we've um, worked together on lots of different independent group shows in South East London um, and I've been thinking about Tamsin and why I love her work and why we kind of keep on ending up working with each other. And she is just one of those artists that always is experimenting with new, um, new techniques, new methods of making. She's always surprising me. I think she's really brave in that way. She doesn't just sit back and say, I can make monoprints. That's all I'm going to do now. Um, and so her work always feels really fresh and exciting and um, I never get bored of it. There's something um, between the balance of the beauty of her images and the fact that they feel quite unsettling, um, which keeps drawing me back. So I'm really pleased to have her in this show and I'm hoping that she is going to request to be part of this conversation um, so that I can press the button and um, invite her to join. So Tamsin, are you there? Can you request to join? And then I will um, let you in. Ah, where is she? Are you there Tamsin? If you can request to join the chat, then all these lovely people will be able to see you. If not, I will try and add you so I could try. Oh, she's trying, she's saying. Okay, um, I will try. Um, let me see if I can find her. There. Let me see if this works. How can something like this be so terrifying? <gasps> yes. So I'm, I'm way too old school for this. <laughs> you had to help me with the request button. <laughs> oh, okay. Good, welcome. Hello. Hi. How are you? Yeah, good, thank you. Yeah, it's very interesting not to have to leave your home for something like this. I know, it's very peculiar. I was trying yeah. to, the only thing that I haven't managed to do, which I wanted to do, was pin a comment to the bottom <laughs> to say who we both are, but um, I'll have to master that for next, next time. Next time we'll make a sign. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, welcome. Um, there's lots of lovely people that are watching, some of whom I know. Hello, Rich. Um, some of you, um, some of you I don't, which is lovely as well. Um, why don't you start off by telling us where you are, Tamsin, um, and describe your surroundings for us, where you're working today. Sure. So I'm in our living room. Um, and having had, obviously working from home now for a couple of months, our dining table has been covered with my, my husband and I both work for ourselves and obviously have needed to work at home. Our dining table has been covered in laptops, art materials and everything for ages. So I finally set myself a little desk <clears throat> next to the window last week where I can um, keep things off the dining table. 
it ended up being a continual rotation of throwing things on and off it. Um, and yeah. have you been to the studio as well? Sorry? Have you been going to the studio? A couple of times, our, perhaps questionably or not, our studios have stayed open. And as lockdown has started to ease a little bit, um, we've been going in a couple of times. But because we're five in the space, we kind of rotate going in so that we don't have to overlap at any point. So we just keep in touch who's going in and... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I've been in, um, I don't know, two or three times. Okay. Um, I mean, we were talking about working in lockdown earlier, where I think for a lot of people in the world working from home in lockdown has been incredibly difficult, but perhaps mm -hmm. artists, um, I think for a lot of artists, it's been more a case of kind of blissful isolation. And have you, how have you found it working in lockdown? Yeah, I mean, I think if, you, if you're in a privileged, privileged situation where you have um, a safe space to self-isolate and your, your basic needs are covered, then maybe you're in a position where you're not worrying about your own health or your loved one's health, then in mm -hmm. a way, I think it's a really amazing time to make work. There are less distractions. You can perhaps come back to what's really essential and think about what really matters to you and put energy into that. Um, for me, I have a one-year-old little girl, Lyra, and she, she, so she was around 10 months when lockdown began. And I was just beginning to try and find ways of making work more regularly, but within the parameters of being a parent. So mm -hmm. I'd like started to get some childcare for a couple of hours a week so I could go in the studio. And funnily enough, about a week before the hint of lockdown started, I finally set up some things on the dining table and was just resolved to the fact that I wasn't gonna get anything done unless it was in the house and ready to go. Yeah, I could perhaps work for an hour after Lyra went to bed or during a nap or something. So yeah, and then that home studio just stayed on <laughs> into lockdown and has stuck around in one form or another. Yeah. Um, so what, what yeah. have you been making, has your work developed um, or taken any new directions, do you think? Because you've... I've been, because of sort of the parameters of parenthood and the lockdown, both those things have lent towards working on a smaller scale and also working with materials that can be resolved in a shorter time frame. So um, a couple of months ago, I was really keen to get back to some real painting and being a painter that has previously always worked on canvas and linen, I needed like something, some real canvas to work on to feel mm. like painting. So I started this series of really tiny little mini ones um, just as a way in, you know, having gone through the whole childbirth and getting used to having a, a baby around, you, there's an inevitable pause and shift in your time to make and your relationship with your work. And so these tiny canvases were just a little way in for me where I could start one and sometimes complete one in the space of a baby's nap. Um, yeah, and, and it's, isn't it that feeling that you've actually achieved something? Yeah, it doesn't, to be honest, hours or whatever it is yeah it doesn't happen that often <laughs> that I manage it but from time to time there's a quiet space when she's sleeping and it feels so good just to have a small frame to work within and I've been working with watercolors and acrylics and yeah that was so that's something that's come up in the last few months um and also um been working a lot more on paper at home sure yeah. sure We've, I mean, it's kind of tied in rather fortuitously with the show that we've got your work in at the moment because um, I think we started, we decided that we were going to do this show together probably about a month before the lockdown kicked in. And we knew we were doing a Works on Paper show, didn't we? But I think we met once as a trio mm -hmm. um, and kind of talked about some ideas and concepts. And then all of a sudden our next meeting was on Zoom and it was over. Um, <laughs> So we've got these wonderful works by you in this show, which um, kind of explore the natural world and the wilderness and man's kind of intervention and carving out of those spaces, whether they're urban or natural spaces. Um, alongside work by Joe and Rebecca, which is 
kind of deals with, as, as we went along, we realised that you were all kind of looking at themes that overlapped in terms of relationships and intimacy and things. So I think, I don't know, I just feel like the lockdown period, it's really kind of heightened the experience of working on this project together and the way that we've had to sort of operate. Um, but I did want to talk a bit about the monotypes because mm. I think it's very kind of particular to you um, and the way that you work. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about and I've got one here actually that I can show because so I think it's really nice to see them without glasses. Because I don't have an example, but I have an example. Shall I, show, shall I hold up my example that I have here? <laughs> um, also to say that it's really lovely to show this because it's not framed and I can put it in front of my big head. Um, um, we've had real trouble photographing this and getting it to look as it does um, on screen is what we've discovered is one of the massive challenges of doing an online project, trying to get those images to kind of truly represent. Mm -hmm. So to talk a bit about how you made this and I'll, I might just hold it here. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's the basic principle of a monotype being a one-off print of some kind or other. Um, and so these water-based ones, what you need for them is a, I'm sure there are many ways of doing it, but um, I work on a dry point etching plate, which is basically a really thick piece of acetate. And it needs, um, so the, the watercolor can be quite slippery to work on the surface. So ideally you need to degrease it before painting on it mm. by using um, so whiting powder it's the same degrease that you might use for preparing zinc etching plates. So if you degrease it, and then I haven't done that on this, but um, I'll even show you. So you work just straight onto the plastic. So Lovely. Yeah, it sort of slips around quite a lot. It can bead off if you haven't degreased, which may or may not matter to you. But um, so that, yeah, you paint on it with watercolors and water soluble pastels these neo color things i don't know if you guys know these they're so lovely to work with even mm -hmm. just direct to paper but they're water soluble so they mix really well with the watercolors and yeah you could use either just the crayons or just the watercolor or a combination of the two then you need to leave it to dry quite thoroughly um depending on how thick you've worked that can take some minutes or hours or overnight yeah, but it's really important, that drying part, isn't it? Yeah. I think a lot of people don't realise that that's, that's a really kind of cu crucial part of the process. It's not just painting it on and then putting it in the press. It's... Yeah, and it's different, like with oils. I haven't done many monotypes with oils, but you actually need to print them wet. The oil still needs to be wet. Yeah. But also not too wet, otherwise it's going to slide around. So, But yeah, the watercolours need to be completely dry. And then... You, in the meantime, soak and blot printing paper. Um, and then you run the two of them through a press. So if you have your paper and plate, put the paper on top, run it through um, a press with a lot of pressure. So about the same pressure as you would for an etching. And amazingly, and I find it a, a wonder every time, every detail of that watercolor transfers immaculately onto the paper mm. and something that I really enjoy about it is it dries in such a particular way on the smooth surface so when you work with paint direct to paper it has also a beautiful sometimes bleeding and wonderful effect but it's quite different the way that it dries on the plastic and the way that the mark dries on the plastic is what then transfers onto the paper so sometimes can get if the watercolor has been very diluted the pigments will sort of start to they'll all dry on the edge of your mark and pull to the edge mm. and you can get a very crisp sometimes glassy interesting and beautiful mark once it's dried and you've transferred it onto the paper so the, even has the feeling of being wet because it might have dripped in your process and left a kind of clear running mark through what you've done and it's, it's, the, it's that element of surprise as well, isn't it? That's so kind of, I think that's what hooks a lot of printmakers in. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think also because I work um, more often than not quite figuratively, often from photographs that I've taken, um, I can find there's a risk for myself of being too kind of referential to that image and too precise. Um, so I enjoy working with things that try that in a way disrupt your own interpretation. Yeah. As a painter, eventually you can start to imitate what you see and that can, can become a bit boring. So with a process like the monotype, you don't have as much control. You, whatever you paint will come out in reverse. As I mentioned, the surface is quite slidey, so you can't, mm. couldn't get a precise mark if you wanted to. Um, and the paint does its own thing on that surface. So, or sometimes I might work with my left hand. All these things help change the image and shift it from what you might first have seen with your eyes into, I mean, that's the beauty of painting, isn't it? It transforms the subject and within that new, a new reading of it can come in and a new understanding of, of the subject that you're working with. Yeah, and I think it gives another of level of intrigue doesn't it because you look at it and you, then you look again and you think hold on a minute there's something that's a bit, little bit strange here or not quite mm -hmm. right yeah uh, what I might try and do is walk the phone over to the toucan because um that's another one that I can show everyone um that's not that easy to show online now if I turn my phone around um there it is oh yeah <laughs> And I saw this plate actually, didn't I? When I came to the studio, when you were working with Joe, I think you... I'm not sure. Um... This was one of the last ones. So before the lockdown, I had a, a last kind of burst at Monotypes and my dining table studio. It's like finally, okay, yeah, I've got a few hours. I'm gonna do these, painted a whole bunch and then printed them, I think a couple of days before travel yeah. time restricted. But yeah, you may have seen a similar similar one when I was working with Joe. And it's funny, this one took a while to grow on me actually. I, I had, it was, um, my reference image was a sort of indoor conservatory space. Um, and I was interested in the light that was coming through the trees and the leaves at the back. And in fact, there was no toucan in the original photograph. Yeah, <laughs> and then <laughs> didn't you? Haven't you taken quite a few photographs at the Barbican in the conservatory? There was it yeah. one of those? <laughs> I have done. It wasn't the Barbican. I can't even remember where it was. If I'm honest, at this moment, I have so many piles of images. I, I don't think there are any toucans in the Barbican, but it might no. be nice if there were. There was no toucan in the photograph, <laughs> and then. And then there's and then there's this um, one that we had a really fun time talking about the title for, didn't we? Oh yes, um, and for the flowers is that? What yeah, it? and we were t you were talking about the idea of a, wi a little windowsill garden while people are in in lockdown and having little yeah. window boxes. Exactly. And then you said, oh, but maybe I'll call it kisses for the flowers. And we just agreed that actually we all needed something a bit more romantic in our lives at that time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think also spending time with my with Lyra, who's you know she's learning to kiss and. She makes us kiss things around the house, puts it in front of our face for a kiss. And I remember being so small and literally sending kisses to like all the plants that I could see. I have, I have a memory of this in some form. <laughs> so that was kind of came back to me with Lyra and yeah, there it is. Yeah, I think it's, it does. I don't think there's anybody that would say that their practice isn't affected by having children in one way or another. Uh, hopefully for the better, of course, because we all love our children. Um, now, the other thing I wanted to talk about was the watercolours, because I said to you a few months ago, I think when we were talking about these monotypes and how painterly they were and how you paint onto the plate, um, I think I said to you, you know, why, why aren't you just kind of painting directly onto paper? And um, you, you said, oh, actually, I've had a bit of a, a breakthrough with my watercolours, didn't you? Well, the curious thing is, is I've been working with the watercolours on monotypes <clears throat> um, for about five or six years. And I know the medium so well for a monotype and really love it in that way. But I've ne never had 
until recently have had no joy working with watercolors direct to paper. They've just been a very mysterious, strange material that I've attempted over and over again and have mm. always been disappointed in what came out. Um, <clears throat> and then recently, um, just with my determination to find a way of working on, on paper in, when I have a, a shorter period to work or working at home, I, I started trying different paper surfaces recently and I came upon, I'm sure many of you will know this paper, it's the Kari paper. I, someone left the pack in my studio, I don't know, seven years ago or something. I was meaning to return it, we lost touch and everything and there it was and I thought, okay, let me try this chunky paper and it's really chunky and not something that I've ever been drawn to working on with my printmaking the the marks are quite subtle or even with the etchings they were always quite precise lines i preferred a, a smoother surface and anyway i tried it for the watercolors and i was amazed it's really transformed transformed the work for me and i found that um it sort of drew out drew out more contrast in the mark i was able to layer in a way i hadn't appreciated before and even to come back and work back into the watercolors in ways that i hadn't really from, like considered possible beforehand so yeah that was the breakthrough and um I've got one here so everyone one um there you go yeah and i've got a couple more here uh it, the edge of the paper is really gorgeous and again there's it's really hard to communicate that um, unless you can kind of see it and hold on to it. And actually the lovely um, local collector who came and bought this um, painting at the weekend, it was just so lovely to, for her to kind of just be able to sort of really see the fibres of the paper. And Yeah, and it becomes, because of that edge and the thickness of it, it really takes on, it becomes a bit more of an object. And yeah. I, speaking of the show, actually, when I popped in to see it I really I wondered I'm wondering if Rebecca she has always had gorgeous paper and her work <laughs> felt so, so much has that wonderful the work on paper like feeling of an object and I wondered if she was using this I need to ask <laughs> oh I think I think you were saying earlier that over it's a really lovely thing to kind of do a group show with people whose work you maybe didn't know that well in the first place because as the weeks go by and you you all recorded your words for the film and you kind of listen to each other and I think you just kind of you you bond don't you even though you're not seeing each other um, absolutely I mean I've been secret or not so secret admirers of both Joe and Rebecca's work for <laughs> some time so I <laughs> say she was using this paper I know oh wow <laughs> um yeah, we'll have to chat surfaces. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it's completely different though, isn't it? The way that you both... Yeah, so true. And how the work comes up so differently. More, um, has a much denser... Uh, oh, so, so wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. They are amazing. But they feel completely different. It's quite surprising mm -hmm. to me, actually, that they're on the same paper. <laughs> yeah. Must have been the same pile that had been sitting there for seven years. <laughs> I think, well, I think Rebecca's been smart enough to find it for a while. Um, yeah, but no, it's a real, it's an honour to show with Rebecca and Joe. And as you say, just by showing alongside one another, you do consider, you spend more time with the work and um, can really appreciate the qualities of it. Um, and yeah, with Joe's, his... He has, seems to have so much respect for watercolour and the way he layers it up with the luminosity and um, it's very inspiring. Right. And this Rebecca so transforming these magical impressions and spaces also. And in terms of um, what, what do you think is going to happen going forward? What future projects have you got planned? Because you've shown in so many different 
Um, I mean, when I was looking back at your what you've done since you've graduated from City and Guilds, you've shown in so many different places in the UK and beyond, you know, the, the big institutions like the Maritime Museum, um, through to the RA, Woolwich Contemporary Print Fair, and lots of, um, lots of projects with independent curators, hospital rooms, House of St Barnabas. Um, what's what's going to happen next? Oh, my goodness, I haven't thought beyond... <laughs> I haven't thought beyond just getting back to making work, to be very honest. Um, yeah, I have a couple of kind of bigger themes brewing, but it's felt with the sort of transition into motherhood and everything, I've, at this moment, I've really I've felt like I've wanted to get back to, to basics and I've been re referencing colour wheel again and, you know, getting to know different palette spectrums and coming back to the material making and yeah just a sort of reset in that way I've been doing these little rain rainbow color studies as you know oh yeah yeah I started a little bit before also before COVID came along and they were just my I would take three colors and make a rainbow from it and that was just my way of getting back to to basics in a way so yeah. Yeah, we'll see what comes next. It, actually feels quite, it, it feels quite daunting now to do something, well, to do anything, doesn't it, in a way, I think. I think we were saying on the phone earlier about being invited round to someone's house for the first time for a meal in the garden and just thinking it was... <laughs> <laughs> That's so true, yeah. <laughs> much. And in fact, any of the ideas that I had brewing, it feels like so many things you just need to put down and let rest and be present to this moment um mm. and what's happening around us and really see where things go from here for everybody yeah and we talked a little bit about travel and the idea of um whether there was somewhere that where we would go we could go because you've you've traveled quite a bit for your work to the arctic and mm. done various residencies but um it sounds like you're very content to kind of stay where you are at the moment you haven't got any fantasy um fantasy locations that you'd rather be in no I mean oh there's so many places I would would dream to go but I th as you say I think I do I feel so content right now and I'm fortunate to have quite a large garden so we're building a fish pond <laughs> attempting to out of an old bath um, <laughs> and some these beautiful foxgloves popped up out of nowhere the other day which I hadn't planted and apparently they take two years to flower so the first year they just leaves I wouldn't have identified them as a small plant and then they popped up and that was so magical um, and felt like such a treasure or gift yeah. so I think yeah um, there's I think it also feels important to really be present to the surroundings that you do have sometimes so I mean always but at this time particularly and there's so much to see and appreciate when you can have a walk through the city and yeah there's there's lots of inspiration thank you so much tamsin um for joining us today it's been really really lovely just to have a long chat with you and see you in your home studio oh thank you so much and thanks everyone who watched and there's a comment about paper that i can't resist quickly seeing and I think it might have been the lovely Caroline from Bed Redbox. Oh, oh yes, who we made, who we made the film with, the short film that everybody should um, watch if they can go onto the website. Um, a little lockdown project of ours where we had the artists kind of record their own voices um, just on your phones. You did it, didn't you? And you sent it over, and then Caroline layered them over the images and the music, and it ended up being this really kind of special project. Um, and I think Caroline was just saying that she had to come round and actually see the paper to actually really kind of appreciate the work and understand it. So I hope that we've kind of commu communicated it all well enough through all the different online channels. And But we are, if anybody does want to see, um, it is the 1st of June today and we, we have always said that we would um, have people over by appointment if anybody wants to see the show for the 1st of June. So just get in touch. Um, we're here. It's easy for me to stand outside if anybody wants to look in total peace and quiet. I've done that a couple of times now. So hopefully see um, a couple of you. Um, 
and hopefully be back in a few days maybe with a different artist if anyone else will agree to, to do this with me so um thank you tamsin Relly. beautiful to see you and um goodbye everybody see you all soon i hope